Oh, Josh, can you slide the flapcast sign over? I, I moved it for the cables. Thanks. And now we're good to go. Uh, oh, silent cell phones. And... I don't need to because no one calls me. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another exciting episode of The Flapcast, where we find out what goes on behind the scenes at a comedy club. I'm Barbara Holliday, your host. I am Joshua Snyder, co-host. today we have one of our amazing headliners, Mr. James P. Connolly, joining us. Hello, James P. Connolly. Hugh James P. Connolly, thank you. Hugh, yeah. Bring in Connolly now. We... <laughs> Excellent. Oh, you have such a sexy voice. Anyway, those of you who are listening to the podcast, the audio quality has not gone up. I am just a better sounding guy. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> really, this is not about... This, and you can do all this magic back there. But this this, this is genetic, baby. This is not... You where, can't. where did you get... It, it is genetic. It is. But you've not honed it? You've not... I think I, just listening to a lot of smooth jazz growing up. And, uh, <laughs> you modeled your voice. And just listening jazz. to other men sexier than me. And uh, just, you know, trying to absorb some of that. So, yeah. Perfect. This is a learned behavior. You can do this. That makes sense because I listen to men who are much unsexier than me. And yes. look, look what happens. Yes. Oh, I know. Yes, yes. It's <laughs> on this voice. And who gets more chicks? Josh, obviously. Yes, because okay. I'm married. Perfect. I have one. Yes. Don't do this to me. <laughs> So, Mr. Connolly, uh, yeah. I have known you, I, I don't even want to say how long, because you look younger than the number of years I would mention. Yeah, we but... don't have to throw a year on this. We okay, can just okay. throw like a loose It's like time. 20, though, I time, think. Time, time. <laughs> Possibly. Now, now you ruined it. 18. Well, 20 years. <laughs> All right, good. 20 years. And you have come so far in the time that I have known you. I mean, I've seen like changes in your comedy and... Um, you know, styles, and now you really, the last, I would say, you know, 10 years, you're like, mm, you're in a groove, man. You're headlining all over the country. Okay. You're the number one listened to comedian on Sirius Satellite Radio, am I right? Yeah, when other people are played, apparently listeners don't listen, but when I come on, <laughs> they listen, so yeah, no. How did you make that happen? Well, I don't know now, hey, there's a guy that I once knew. Um, <laughs> Uh, Wait, I, now, and now you don't know? I don't know anymore. Dave Bryant's walked through the room. Yeah. Uh, no, that just kind of happened by circumstance. I think someone told me. And now they have so many people they play, so I don't know if that moniker holds as strong anymore. But I, they just, you know, the, the comedy's, I mean, uh, XM and Sirius started doing comedy, and they needed CDs, and mine happened to be in the pile. And they just started playing them, and uh, people actually responded to them. Funny. That's okay, funny. okay, wait, wait. Now let's not get carried so away with that. They're, they're funny. hilarious. But wait, a they lot occupy time on satellite radio <laughs> network. They need content. They need content. You gave content. And I gave them content. You give good content. I give excellent content. Yeah, I've content. Been given so here's my question about wait, the wait. set. Yeah, because comedians want to know how do you actually get that? How did you? Who did you? Well, that wasn't content? my question, but oh. we'll go with that. Okay. <laughs> it's all right. Well, we have a lot of the, we have a lot of comedians. We will listen. tell you what your questions are, Joshua, and yes, then you will we'll ask them. Yes, we will guide probably. the questions. You know. Questions. So here's my question: How do comedians get onto serious? Yes, <laughs> good question. <laughs> now it's a little more of a gray area because everybody that I know moves jobs, and everybody that I write. I've walked a few CDs into New York and just said, "If you don't play this, you're an idiot." Ooh, of other comedians? Yeah, because I people oh, that I know, that's can awesome. I throw out a little, Rocky yes. Laporte. <gasps> Rocky Laporte Hilarious. did not have, and so he did the CD, and I said, give it to me, I'm going to New York, and I walk in and I go, this play now on air, let me make you look. His last name is French for the port? Exactly, the <laughs> So that, I've done it a couple times just to people, that, headliners that I know that I can't believe aren't on, so I said, I'll go in and give it to them because I just can't. I can't even fathom that they don't play you. And that works. Yeah, it works great because yeah, they didn't they put it in there. Yeah. Right. But now it's kind of nebulous. I don't know. I mean, I got lucky because when they started, Sonny Fox was at XM. And it was just at XM Comedy. And he came to the Boston Comedy Festival. And he liked what I did. And so he said, give me your CD. And I said, here you go. Wow. And then they played it. And then Sirius, I think Sirius started to come around. And then they saw who XM was playing. And so they wanted my CD. So I don't really know how to do it. But I know that it worked. Well, I heard there's a competitor now. It's called like unserious satellite radio. Really? Yeah, or not really serious satellite radio. No. Where are the vast majority of the listeners for? Are these people in cars or are these people? Yeah, most of my demographic cars. are um, encased listeners. They're trapped. Oh, in cars they? or offices. I don't really appeal to people with free will. Ah. Really, you know, people that like me are the, they can't go anywhere and they have to listen. And so yeah, you know, I have truckers, people that travel a lot. 
um, I do a lot of gigs and people that rent cars used to know who I am because they just flip in dials and they heard of me. So it's hard to target that and harness that into power. <laughs> but uh, randomly across America in some of the remotest regions of people, like in the farms, they know me. If you don't book James P. Connolly, uh, your shipment of cabbages will exactly. not Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Huge on the turnip circuit. Uh, yeah. I, I will get the truck drivers who... You love, I once did a show for the Oklahoma Association of Electric Cooperatives, which is a random loose grouping of hardworking Americans. Electricians. Who, uh, you know, provide power and co-ops to farmers. And, and they asked, why would anybody want? And they go, no, a lot of these people know who you are. They have farms out there. They have satellite radio. So we did there. There's like the attorney general was there. The lieutenant governor was there. And then before the show, they say, you know, before this whole thing begins, they do this whole, uh, they, they parade in, the dignitaries parade in to the tune of Oklahoma. And I said, I cannot wait to see this. And she said, see it, you're in it. And I was like, <laughs> so I, I got in line. I said, Oklahoma, where the wind get And I took my seat, and then I had to perform some. Oh, wow. And well, does, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying I've done that. Does some of that uh, control come from your military background? So you were in the military, right? Yeah, I actually, I actually started because my colonel asked me to write him. Well, didn't ask. It was a direct order to write him jokes. <laughs> when a colonel says, "Do you mind?" It's not really. It's like, "Hey, in your free time." It's like, "Sit down, and do this for me." So he wanted to roast all these other officers in the unit. So they asked me. So I sat down. I grabbed some lieutenants, and I said, "We have an opportunity to really attack." verbally officers that we would legally not be able to do so because the colonel's going to do it so we wrote them out and then like an hour before the dinner I get a knock on my uh well my hatch would be militarily perfect and it was the executive officer saying the colonel needs to see you and I was like oh god I crossed the line so I went in there thinking I was going to get hung and instead he was like so what did you how did you see this being delivered and I was like oh you want tips so I was like showing him what I meant and so he killed and I said all right if I don't die in the war I'll come back and I'll do this. And when you say he killed, isn't he got laughs because of the he military? Do... He didn't actually. Yeah, let me just correct that. Yes, it was not that's, really that's, that's important. No Thank you, died. Joshua. Good, 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 good to know. Yeah, that you, you should be so careful with that. useful you are. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they bring me along. He's basically right. the human footnote. As I told you, what yes, you meant by this was. Yeah. What branch were you in the Marines, right? Yeah, what br there's one branch. I mean, oops, oops, I messed up. You were in the Marine Corps. Uh, I would have made the same mistake that she just made right there, so I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> I do it with no, sports, too. Yes, <laughs> which, I, was, I was a Marine Corps. Which team were you on, maybe, I should I say? Marine team. Oh, perfect, played, yeah. perfect. Marine team, yeah. That's great. What color were they? They were red. red. They're the swimmy ones, Flex right? of yellow. Flex of yellow, yeah. <laughs> oh, are we, we're not being disrespectful no, by not, not knowing Not to that. me. There's a few Marines out there who will take you down after we, the park. <laughs> 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 I mean, all I know of the Marines is that they were the ones who were sent in an aliens in the sequel. The, Send in the Marines. That's what we're known yes. for. Uh, <laughs> fantasy combat. That's what we're known for. Yeah. We're, uh, Sigourney Weaver, one of ours. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> So literally, so, well, wait, technically, I, I like, she was a civilian. I like what you bring to this. Not a lot of reality. I like it. I did not know that that is how you start got started doing comedy. So that's yeah. fascinating. Did, immediately when you were discharged, did you start going to the clubs or what? Well, no, what I took, it took a more um, a more strategic approach. I was a karaoke host, mobile disc jockey. <laughs> of course. Uh, just to really accelerate the humiliation platform. <laughs> Before I do stand up comedy, I After thought, the military. Yeah, trying to get people to sing, you know, karaoke and Benny Hanna was the way to go. <laughs> so I did that for a year and a half until I couldn't take it anymore. And then I uh, I applied for a job. I was living in San Diego and I said, okay, if I want to do stand up, I got to do it. So I applied for a job as a tour guide at Universal Studios. And I thought, if I get the gig, I'll move to LA. And so I got the gig. And I don't want to brag, but I was making $5 an hour. <laughs> And, uh, yeah. So wow. that lasted like three months, and then basically I was starving to death because I was a grown man, Marine veteran with debt, and I was working with kids whose parents were helping them pay for food. I'm like, how do you live on $5 an hour? And they didn't seem too concerned about it, but I did. So then after that, I just I, then I decided to do stand-up. I basically subjected myself to forms of public torture. I couldn't take it anymore, then I moved to the next level so I could finally get myself to do stand-up. And so you started in L.A.? Yeah, I actually started here. Yes. And, and what was that at, at that time? What was it? Well, that was before electricity, okay. and uh, <laughs> people were churning butter. And uh, shows ended early when the whale oil ran out. Did that sound really? <laughs> we didn't have the same. Yeah, you kids, your microphones, you kids today with your amplification. <laughs> my God! Back I then totally, we shouted. Totally, the late yeah, shows we just shouted. Totally over unintentional drunk on my part to <laughs> aid you there. Totally unintentional. So when you started, were there cars or no horses? We took horses to the clubs and. Yes, it took audiences well, hours. Here's why I asked that because I, like I, I'm I'm still I would classify myself as still just starting out. Like I, 2008, 2009, when I started in LA, okay. 
and it's and I'm I'm always curious to know how um, how much it has changed, you know, in kind of my camp versus when you were uh, if, when, well, you when were I started. Start Comedy was dying. Like all the boom of all the older right. comics talking about they're making like ten grand a weekend and snorting cocaine off each other and doing all these great things. And, and it sounded good, but I didn't. The clubs were all dying. But I, the first two clubs I got into shut down within three weeks of me getting into the club. So, and then when I got into the improv, you know, uh, Bud said, "Yeah, you can be a regular." And then he sold controlling interest like three years. So I just basically <laughs> I came in on the crash. You have bad yeah, luck. I'm, I shut down a lot of clubs. I'm surprised yeah. Flappers is still here. Right. <laughs> So, uh, so everything was like shrinking, and a lot of older comedians were angry and bitter because they were still fighting with me for bar gigs in San Clemente, and I used to be a Letterman, and I'm like, well, not right now, you know. You're not. <laughs> so that was tough. But nothing was nothing was really happening, so it was really like that. I tried to lay low. But you know, this this <laughs> work room is lay, lay low. I didn't want anybody to know me. But like this you. is gonna sound. I'm not just saying this because you're here in front of me and you're you're. <laughs> You're, but, I'll be the judge of that. Yes, yes. But you are truly amazing, consistent, oh, hilarious, and professional. And that's one of the things that I really want to point out. Like, I am petrified every weekend when comedians show up, you know, at 8.05 for their 8 o'clock gig. It just, it's, un, and, oh, I don't even know <laughs> where to begin. You are yeah. always on, you're early. You're always on time. Oh, you never, I never have to worry about you. Like, I, even if I'm booking you on an offsite event or a corporate thing, or you're just 100% consistent. Yeah, I've shown up to gigs with a client, wasn't there? Yeah, let's I, talk I, about that. Let's talk about that. About that. Yeah. Well, and know, we paid you anyway. And you did, anyway. that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was a great time. But it was fun. weird. So, but how did you get this sense of perfection? Because that's why you're working I think I remember, all the time. I remember, I think I picked up the phone when that happened. Yeah, I'm yeah. glad somebody picked up the phone because hey, I was in my car, uh, I was in Temecula. There, there are there's occasions. There's a beautiful area here, but there's no show. There's no show. <laughs> Enjoy the scenery. I, say, I got a donut. I'm hanging out. But with see, donut. like stuff like that happens, and some comics would be total assholes to us about that. Yeah. Like we did have, you know. I tell a lot of you in comedy. If you think, like, if you think linearly in comedy, you will die. You will kill yourself. You will just not want to be here because it's just not. <sighs> it's not linear at all. And randomness is the norm. And so I try to get places early. Because a, I like to plug into my environment, whatever's going on. You know, I want to see, I want to feel the room. I don't need to hear the specific joke of the comic, but I need to feel what's going on before I get there. And it also helps me shift gears because I have a life of the comedy. I have a, a wife and son who depend on me, which is a big mistake. But, <laughs> but and it helps me. And also, I know the club owner and the client, whoever's booking me, relaxes the minute I walk in the door. Yeah. Which makes my life easier. Because I know you got to be talented and you have to be funny, but I also know that you know I've been fortunate, and it was very kind of you to say. People say they enjoy working with me, oh, so, so much. that also helps. You know, when you're booking, it's like there's fame, there's talent, and then there's what's somebody come coming to and said, you know, I can have you in here, and I pay you blah blah blah, and uh, there's no problems, and the crowd has a good time. He goes, well, I can pay you know whatever for this really famous guy, mm -hmm. and yeah, we get a draw, but it's like and they have the posse and they have the awesome. demands and they just try to yeah, so on. And so I was like, I said, so I'm like a a pleasant compromise. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's a kind of a compliment. You'll have a, you'll be working forever, though. I have well, no doubt in my mind that well, you will have a career for a very, very long time. Well, I may, I'm gonna guess that death will yes. stop this run, but I'm, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I think it's good enough. Go on, everyone. Hey, you know what? You gotta, well, you gotta go with what you can do. Yeah. One thing I can do is show up on time. One thing I can do, I'm very consistent in that. Even if the audience is tough. I think there's something I can do. You don't f around with your material at no, all, I don't, either. I don't. I don't. When you're on I a try. Gig. I will go down mm -hmm. with the ship in front of everybody, and that's okay. That's part of the job to me. It's right. not, hey, they're horrible. I gave up halfway through. It's like, no, I don't like you. And if you ask me bluntly, I would say horrible things about you. But on the stage, I'll do everything I can to make this work to the best of my ability. And if it sucks, yeah. when I get off stage, you'll hear me go, that sucked. I hate those people. Right. But well, I won't say it on stage. When did you Rarely. learn that? Because uh, I think it takes a long time for comedians to really under, because it's so easy to blame the audience. You know, I've done you know? shows where the, the audience was horrible. Yeah, and they are was horrible, horrible sometimes. But because I didn't but... give up in like minute 35 of the 45 minute set, <laughs> they suddenly went with me because I wasn't stopping. Right. I've had sets where I ate it for 55 minutes of an hour. In minute 55, where no better, I had no material left, I started to try to sell CDs. 
they went ballistic with joy that I would eat it for 55 minutes and then go, you know, I got some CDs after the show. And that bit, the last, so the, if you ask them what happened that night, they would say it was a good show. If you ask me, it was like, it was one of the worst experiences of my life. <laughs> However, I sold five CDs. Do you think it's possible, oh, wow. do you think it's p possible uh, or have you experienced a situation where you go up, you think it's a terrible show, and then you get compliments and you're like, has that? Have oh, all the time. I get off stage and I go, that was horrid. And people will go, man, we had a great time. So it's not really our agenda, it's not their agenda. Mm -hmm. And I love, I want to go up and work on my material, I want to do this, and I want to work on certain things, but, and I want to make them laugh. But sometimes I hate what I have to do, but I have to do it anyway. And then they leave happy and they'll come back. Well, that keeps the club alive, that keeps people thinking positively about me, even if I'll drive home and go, man, I couldn't get any of my material out. That person who had a great time butchered everything I did, yet still, they thought it was entertaining. <laughs> well, you know, that's part of the job. Well, uh, you know, you also do, what I admire about you is you do a lot for... Impressions? Uh, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, so when I was saying about the transition, you know, Mr. Connolly used to do sort of this Las Vegas lounge lizard kind of guy, um, character, sort of more character -y bit, but that has now, like... Uh, dropped out of the act completely and you are, have I think sort of flourished ever since so did that did going into that character um, I know happen to know there's someone listening who might find this uh, interesting as well wait people listen to this too? yes yes oh. there's there are comics listening who, who awesome. really insist on that character you know yeah. and um, that worked for a while you but did. and I love doing it but there was just a time where I thought you know what I thought it was it I start I was always conscious that doing that character and getting older, at some point, if you're younger and you play like this, you know, off-dressed, somewhat lounge lizardish guy who thinks he's, but at some point you're going to age into creepy, <laughs> and at some point they're going to look at you and go, "No, you could be that guy." And so I'm always conscious of going, "I can't be 50 doing that because then it looks sad to me." So I didn't want to be pathetic, and so I did it to a place, and it did really well for me. But then I. Didn't, I was like work backwards. I didn't know who I was on stage. People would like hire me to host TV and radio shows. Have never seen my stand up. Couldn't even believe that that was my act. And then people that saw me do stand up couldn't believe that I could host. Because, like, how can that character host? So I just wanted to figure out who I was. How do I take those two worlds and merge them so that when I get on stage, you see both? How did you do if that? It, I experiment, screwing it up, <laughs> miserable sets. Horrible, horrible experiences. <laughs> I really didn't know what I was doing. I just said, I gotta do it, and I don't want to lose headlining status, and I don't want to starve to death, so I've got to figure a way to do it on the fly, still be funny enough that I get booked back, yet experiment. So I took some clubs that I headlined, and I said, do you mind if I just feature here for a couple of years? Ah. I said, I'd rather feature three, four times a year, just under the radar, Working just work on, yeah. And, yeah. Th and then, and a couple of clubs in this area were like, oh, we'd love it. And I said, seriously, I just need to get up and do 20 to 30, where good enough is good enough. See, what's interesting about what you're saying is that what helped you, I'm sure, is that you were in tune with what you needed to do to progress as a performer. I think a lot of comedians, um, what mostly happens is they bitch to us about the time. Like, they're like, five minutes, you know? Yeah. And I have never heard once heard you bitch about time. In fact, when you email me, do I not almost respond to you instantly? Because I know that almost you are, instantly. You're, uh, you're very clear about what you're looking for. Like, you'll tell me, hey, I want, I'm yeah. working on a five-minute late-night set, or I'm working on a ten-minute, or I want to do 20 minutes because... Yeah. And that helps me, as a booker, just instantly book you. Well, I, well first of all, I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, not every booker gets back to you right oh. away. <laughs> uh, I have emails from 1987 that oh, never okay. been. Well, yeah. now, you know, I tell people, I always have, every week I know exactly what I'm working on or why I'm on stage. Wow. And I used to not do that. So, whether it's new jokes, whether it's I have a bad habit I'm working on, whether it's something I'm prepping for, I always try to know what I'm there for. So no matter what happens, even if the set didn't go great, I'll walk away. That was awesome, because what thing I worked on, I did. Whether it was slow down, whether it was... You know, talking too fast in my opening, whether whatever it was, and no one might even know what I'm working on, but I know what I'm working on, and it helps me too when I email other clubs. I say, hey, you know, I got this showcase. I'm doing this thing for late night. I can I do this? It works. Like, yeah, we'll give you five minutes. Yeah, yeah. it totally works. I mean, the biggest misnomer I think in in the booking process is that it's just like any 
job, you know, walking into an interview. You can't just walk in and go, hey, I'm going to do any job here. You, you, if you are clear on what job you want to do, we can help you get that job, you know? And that's each time, unfortunately, as a comic, you're constantly getting jobs. That's what you're doing. You're constantly trying to get jobs. Yeah, and I was talking to someone else about yeah. and I, I appreciate you say that I'm consistent because that's that's probably one thing I actually take pride in, is that I okay. try to always deliver something so that, because I know, I think it was during the Comedy Festival, Richard Barrett was up in Comedy Match talking about that. Yeah. And that's the that club too. That's like, you know, you show up as the gazelle that's going to get eaten by the alligator and you don't come back because it's painfully obvious the talent that's on the stage some night in here too. And it's like, you, you'll stick out. You will stick out on a big night. So it's like, you know, try to find the right places to experiment and goof around. And, and then when you're in a club long enough, then obviously then they... You can you mess, guys, you can, you I, let us I mess don't around because, what you do. Because at that point, I'm like, I anything. will still make it's the hilarious. thing work, even if it, my little new children die in front of me. <laughs> when was the first time you headlined and where? Good question. I think it was Laughs Unlimited in Sacramento. And I was featuring for my good buddy Don Friesen, who had just... Don. He, Don was just new headlining, and so he saw me. At, we did the San Francisco Comedy Competition together, so he was like, would you like to feature? Because he trusted me to set him up. And I was like, oh my God, I need to get into club. So we kind of went on the road together initially to do that. And the owner there was really cool and experimental, and he had his own ideas and what he wanted to do. And so he was just, you know, he liked what I did, and he said, you want to headline? I was like, yeah, I just said yes. I didn't really know if I could do 45, but... I've done that twice. One time I had to film for headliner. I was in Reno featuring, and the headliner was late, and I was in the room, and I was nervous about featuring, and get a call from the club. They go, hey, headliner's playing, it's late, so you're going to headline, we're going to bring a local feature. And I was like, got it. Hung up the phone, and I just had a panic attack. <laughs> and I called my manager at the time, and I was like, well, I said, well, what did you say? Well, I said yes. He said, well, that's the right answer. I said, what am I going to do? I don't have 45 minutes. And I said, so they told me to talk to the crowd. So from a place of absolute fear and panic, I worked the crowd, and anything that looked viable to me, I just jumped on it and ad-libbed as deep as I could go. Now, it turned out to be a great set, but it was total fear, total <laughs> panic, and no, it was just, I, if I had to do it again the next night, I would have thrown up, I think, so. You know what, though? Your voice and your delivery is just so uber-confident. I mean, I, It's there's... a smoke screen. <laughs> But but there's something to be said for that. Like there's something to be said for fear-based confidence. Off. Right, exactly, <laughs> definitely. But we can learn from that because no matter what you say, you say it with absolute 100% conviction. Well, I look at it this way: I have when I hit the stage, I have to do the time that I agreed to. I will never get off early. I do not find that attractive in a comedian. I would rather see you die <laughs> your full time than bail. I think that is a you know I'll wow. cut you once, but I think that's a horrible, horrible emotional habit to get into because the, it's not about bailing. It's about you may, in your moment of hell, come up with something so brilliant and you'll hate the people that squeezed it out of you, but you'll take it with you for the rest of your career and do stuff with it. And I got heckled mercilessly in Moscow, Idaho one time. And one of the heckles was so stinging that I took it, adjusted it, and put it in my act that's on my first CD. I used it for myself. Because it was, if this is what they were thinking of me, and this guy, I, I mean, I almost wept when he said what it. Was it I forget it? exactly what it was, but I remember to myself, this I will use. Other people. <laughs> so it's like, you know, there's something to be said for going down swinging. Plus, it's a camaraderie out there. When it's audience sucks, and you go up one at a time through the meat grinder, and you're giving each other a hard time, it's because you're going to step up and do it too. You're not a critique, crit you know, you're not criticizing, you're going to do it. So you can be as merciless as you want to. And you watch your talented friends die because you'll have a shot and you'll probably <laughs> die too so do it with flair <laughs> yeah. and i don't enjoy it don't get me wrong i'm not cop i'm not cocky i don't enjoy it at all but it's part of the job so learn how to get through it and squeeze something out of it what's your batting average would you say on um, when you're writing like you write 10 jokes okay you know, you'd think and this is the delusion Sports i again. think that i have you, know, you think your batting average will go up the batting average does not go up it, it's like spurts i will Aww. blurt something out of my mouth virtually perfect three lines and i'll just like wow and then you get thinking i can do that <laughs> and you can't and then you'll sit down and write something man this is and nothing and so I don't know what to tell you. My batting average is good enough to keep going. <laughs> I'm in the league still. I don't, I don't even know if I can tell you what it is. It's just what would a, be a good number? I, I don't, don't even know. Sports. One question I always wonder is: do, do, do the more you do it, does it 
does the batting average go up? Ah. And I guess you're kind of saying it, it really never does. It's, I think it's always... you know what to do with a good idea now, mm -hmm. but coming up with ideas, for me anyway, it's harder because I'm, what is it Tom Clark said? You know what your problem is, my problem is, we're logical thinkers. So when other people jump up and talk about stuff, well, we'll go, no, that, that's not true because what you need to do is. Uh -oh. so sometimes it's harder for me to find something to talk about, but then when I find something I like, it's easy for me. I know what to do with it now. So does that make sense? Mm. Well, you coming for me anyway. from, Well, like, and coming from the military, you, you have a lot of inside jokes, probably still, that work, and you get booked on a lot of military gigs, right? Yeah, I don't really like, I mean, honestly, I don't like a lot of inside jokes, even for corporate and military. I think mm. just knowing the environment helps you make the right ad lib comments because you know what's going on. I think going for the inside, this is personal, you know, going for the inside joke, it's doable and it works. Well, you know what's even better is just being you in that environment. And so if you don't know what's going on, that's your point of concentration. If you do know what's going on, then you can, for me, like I can fake my way through some stuff because I kind of know just enough to sell that I might know more, even though I forgot most of that stuff by now. Right, right. Well, I think you create more that way. Yeah. Like I, don't, I do a lot of corporate hosting. I do not have an outline. I do not do the same thing every company twice. Do you look up the company, though? I look it up. I don't really them. care what they have to say. Uh, I listen and look because what's, what grab my brain grabs is different than theirs. When they say, oh, you got to talk about this, I don't, probably not. Right. And I may see something that no one thinks is funny but me and that's what I'm going to go with because that's the stuff I trust. Yeah. Well, I'll never forget even just a couple years ago you broke your foot. Yes, I did. And you got such great material out of that. I highly recommend physical trauma. Yeah. It's really, it's really a way to go. I, just, I saw another comic about that. I was like, you know, it's true and I hated it at first because I had to... I had to write about it because you can't. Hop I just on want to stage. point out that that you just said I was talking about that with a comic, and you pointed to because that's where that comic was, where. and she was there when I talked. Invisible. About it, so she it was sitting somewhere over there. I don't know why I felt the need to visualize. It's a good podcast to point. That's always a good yes. to point. <laughs> you can see. Pointing facial pointing expressions right. kill. Uh, so yeah, it forces you to write about it. So. Yeah, I, I hated it. I didn't want to. I wanted to work on other material, but how do you not open with you it when you, when you limp on, on stage right. and you cast? And you go, so dogs, huh? It's not going to work. <laughs> right. Yeah. What happened to you? Everyone wants to know. Yeah. And so it's a great lesson in being present. Yeah. But you are always present. You're very clear and present in the room. And You know, I was starting to say earlier, I just wanted to get back into it, was that you do, you do a lot of great things for... Um, causes as well specifically every year you do a veterans um show oh yeah which is very right close to your heart and yeah. that cocktail uh, we call it camouflage uh, cocktails, and camouflage. And, camouflage. cocktails and camouflage november 6th flappers comedy club main room 8 p.m Ooh, we got a free ad i love it uh, uh, yeah no i like i like doing what's I mean, behind I, that i like know? doing charities i like doing fundraisers if i have the time and i can jump up and help i will I, it's this you know that's one of the fun things about doing this yeah, yeah. And, and i I know people are very appreciative, but my attitude is, if I have the time, if I can do it, I will. Because it's a skill that you can really lend to raise money and help a lot of stuff. And yeah. So I think that just comes back, you know, big picture. Comedy and fundraising are very intertwined. Yeah, you know? people always need to make the, yeah, so I, I like doing this. It's, and I like helping the veterans cause, you know, you can't help them all, but I like to do the one here. We just, you know, we raise money for Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation, veterans in film and television stuff. It's fun. And it's me, so one time I'm willing to do like the detail work of producing a show. Once the a year. one time, but you're so good at Once it. Once a year. Well, you secure help with that yes. too. Yeah, Thanks, Dane Eagle. Yeah, if you're Dane listening. Eagle saves most All of you. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we love having you for that show. And what's what's on what's on your agenda for the future? What's what are your big plans? Well, TV, I film? just found out a couple of days ago <gasps> that I was contacted by Last Comic Standing to audition for season nine, what? which was kind of cool because I was just getting my package together. To I was asking like Lachlan and Rocky and those guys, what should I do it? And Lachlan was like, well, you might want to get ready because I told them about you. And I was like, what? And they even they said, yeah. Yay! So I'll be at Flappers County Club this weekend working on a short set. <laughs> well, we are having our birthday yes, you weekend. Are. We're turning four. And yes, you are. You're the same age as my son. That's right. oh, Mr. Connolly, though, I have to say, sorry, does that make you sound older, but has been instrumental in helping this club in particular be successful by working as a solid headliner, you know, not just being a, a, a pro and not being a greedy fucking comic that just, you know, I'm telling well, you. Well, let's no, just say, I, I, I don't explain. like to promote myself, but I am probably the greatest raffle prize giver I've ever yes, heard in my yes, life. Yes, yes, that is true. I think comics I know they go, dude, I've never seen you do stand-up, but... That was the most entertaining raffle I've ever seen. And I was like, I take great pride in mocking 
the gift packs you put together for the show. <laughs> I think it's really, it's a skill I can die with. I, I know everyone's listening and I'm like totally kissing your ass, but I'm serious that there is nobody that comes to my mind quicker when I think oh, of Oh, well, thank you. Well, you guys are so nice to me. You give me stage time, with. you let me come up and do this yeah. stuff. And so. Well, let's keep this relationship going for a very long time, you know? Um, and uh, did you really have your son when we were at that first year? Yeah, he's oh uh, the same God, age. Yeah, he came crazy. shortly after you guys. I didn't One believe player. you had a wife and family. I have no, a wife, so I have a son. Right? She, yeah, she's beautiful. She's, she's mean as well. Or? No, well, she used to give me suggestions for my act, and then she started saying, I'm going to put it in, she said, well, she's going to put it in her act. So, one of these days, I'm going to do a show, like Spouses of Comedians, in which they all we all help our spouses put together five minutes. We do it in the Yoohoo Room. Comedy couples. We just bring it in there, and it's a supportive, somewhat mocking, but supportive environment <laughs> in which oh, our spouses do it, oh. but then, you know, we're on the line, too, because we coach them. Oh. So I think it'd be fun. And I know a couple of comics, wives and husbands, who said, I'd do that. I said, I would love to do that. <laughs> Spousal mentors. Yeah, awesome. Ew, it sounds horrible. It'll be fun. <laughs> well, but... So how do you work on your five minutes? Yeah, all right. Yeah, you. That, that sounds like a great show. Let's do it. It'll be fun. It'll be we'll fun. put that with the Christopher Titus Embarrassing Videos show. That's We'll line those two back to back and we'll have a great uh, There's an idea that yeah, you find an early video of you. And embarrassing then, and Video Night. Everyone. And play it. Oh, I had a very like similar that? idea yeah. that everyone has to come to the party with the footage of their first stand-up performance. Ah. Every comic okay. has to bring the earliest one, and you sit there, and then one after the other, we just mock each other <laughs> mercilessly. I have mine. Play, and I, I play. We I Twitter. Used to, I while used to we're watch watching. it once a year to remind. Even when I was, I was depressed, I would feel good about myself. Like, well, you're better than that. <laughs> and was it the one at the military, or was it? No, at this was a uh, the first stand-up I did in L.A. Was I took a comedy store, UCLA extension class with Sandy Shore, Mitzi's oh, daughter. God. First time she ever did a class. And I did it just because I'm the type of person that I put the carrot out in front of me. If I say I'm going to do it, and I'll tell people I'm going to do it, then I'll do it. That's my bravado. If I keep to myself, I'll never do it. So I took from Sandy. So I did. I took the class, you know, I, and in that, so Brody Stevens was in that class. Were the Peter stars Sprite. and the moons aligned? She was perfectly very cool. Right? And I didn't listen to her. And you're supposed to work on the same set for the eight weeks. And I every week I came with three new minutes because this was my audience, right, class? So I remember doing that in the original room. And the funny part is, you invite your friends, board environment. So my college roommate comes to support. Great guy. And he's sitting in front, it's like flappers here, where the front row is the edge of the stage and people are looking at you. But he was so nervous that any time I looked at him, he looked away. <laughs> so he came to support, but imagine every time you look at the front row, they just shoot their glance somewhere else. And it drove me nuts. And I was like, this is worse. We show up to support. We're not going to look at you. We will listen to you. We're present physically. And I want to just scream on it and go, look at me. Look at me. Now you realize if you would have done that, how funny that would have been, huh? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you can't, I couldn't have wrote that. It's been an emotional breakdown. Awesome. Oh, perfect. Oh, that's fun. Well, let's invite him this weekend. Yeah, he's... So James P. Connolly is here this weekend for our birthday weekend, I... along with other headliners, Jimmy Schubert, oh, yeah. Rory Kilmartin, Jeff Garland Jeff on Friday, Garland, Tone uh, Bell, Tone Bell. Uh, I think Laura Hayden will be oh, up my God. too. Yeah. And you never know who's going to drop in. And last year you did this with yeah, us. Yeah, it's a great show. It's fun. The place is Insane. packed. Everybody's jumping up, doing a few minutes. Cake, it's champagne. Cake, champagne. It's just uh, jokes and people. Oh my God! Just five minutes. Everyone's doing solid. I mean, just the best headliners doing five minutes. Uh, it's such a great weekend. So it's fun. It's it's fun for the comedy. It's great. You know, if you you're gonna come out, come out. Thank it's free you. admission. Free admission all week. It's only one week a year we do this. So that's great. Because I'm so tired of, of paying to perform. I really, yeah, I really, yeah. Really, yeah. <laughs> but we're glad that you're. you're and this is the first year we're doing it in Claremont as well. That's Friday right. And Saturday. Devin and Joel. Uh, so we're gonna get up stage here, and we're gonna drive to yep, Claremont. Yep. Five minutes. You all have to. Wow. It's gonna be a yes, yes. Perfect. And um, what about your website? Any other things you wanna promote? Yeah, you can go to uh, jamespconley.tv. What's that P? Is that Paul? It's pa that's actually Pat? Patrick. Oh, Pat, the Irish James Connolly. Yeah, James Connolly. You can check Facebook, Twitter, and yeah, I'm doing a lot of local shows, and I'm in and out. But uh, yeah, the big one is uh, last come in two weeks. And then I have you on the schedule for next year, I'm sure. Though I don't like, know, but I'll come. Check, to, to show check up his. From here. Yes, I'll it's just. There. There's you're there's on flappers there. on there all the time. You can pick whatever you want. Just you just tell in. me the dates, and you, they're yours. Sweet. We'll do it right now. Okay. No, <laughs> while you're listening. <laughs> okay. so, I want to headline here in 2037. Perfect. Yeah. That would be. May uh, five. He does plan ahead. I That's good. Yeah, That's good. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And you know, we also have this segment here. We like to. Um, 
encourage new and young comedians uh, up and coming. It's called Punch It Up, this segment we do here on the Flapcast every week. It it's violent. not Punch It Out, it's not Punch Em Out. But uh, we asked a comic to come on and do three minutes for us, and then we and you, your amazing uh, knowledge and skill, we impart on these uh, up and coming comedians and hopefully help them out with some tags, lines, ideas. Are you in? I'm in. Let's punch All right, let's somebody. punch it out. Let's All punch right. it out. Our comedian today is is uh, Stretch SHP, ladies and gentlemen. Stretch SHP. Thank you. Oh, come become an audience. I like it. It's great. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh my God, you guys are excited as I am. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, doing this flap cast. Anything to get me out of my day job. Uh, I call it my day job because I live in Hollywood, so I still have real dreams. Uh, but I bartend at a restaurant, so I mainly work at night. Uh, it's pretty glamorous for a day job, you know what I mean? There's, there's cash on hand, there's chicks always around. Not as glamorous as my last day job, which was more like a day, night, kind of all the time. I sold cocaine, that's what I did. Uh, <laughs> That's right, I used to be a big time Hollywood cocaine dealer for 13 years. Uh, big time. Soup's huge. Soup's huge. Uh, and the number one, I tell people this all the time, and the number one question I ask when people find out that I used to be a big time Hollywood cocaine dealer for 13 years, the number one question I asked is, uh, do you have any right now? Uh, the second most asked question is, no, seriously, do you have any? And the third most asked question when people find out that I used to be a big time Hollywood cocaine dealer for 13 years is, uh, why are you telling us your life story? Can you please just take our order? Because uh, I'm always at the restaurant. <laughs> Nobody cares about my past accomplishments but me. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, my girlfriend is a, is a stripper, guys. My girlfriend's a stripper. Uh, don't get too excited about it. She'll strip her anywhere. She has a very weird way of doing it. Uh, she only pulls out one boob at a time, and it always has our baby attached to it. So. But if you see her, tip her, because uh, we could use the money, guys. We could use the money. Uh, that is just my weird way of saying, my funny way of saying, my girl will breastfeed our son anywhere, which is amazing. Breast milk is the best milk, guys. It's the best milk. Uh, and we're lucky. She's overproducing, so we're starting to like stockpile milk in the freezer. And a proud, happy dad in me is like, that's amazing that my son has access to this. But the ex-drug dealer in me is like, we need to flip this breast milk. You know what I mean? We need to get some money, sweetheart. Uh, every time I open the freezer, it's just like baby bricks of breast milk. It's like a scene from The Wire in there. Uh, it is. It's amazing. Breast milk is amazing. It's just so amazing. Do you guys know how much formula costs? <laughs> I don't. I got a factory living right next to me in my bed, pumping out the best stuff. And her main client sleeps right next to her. We streamlined it, made it efficient. Uh, it is the best milk. It has everything, all the stuff in it, all vitamins and minerals. It's like it's like a protein shake for babies to help them grow. Uh, it could also be used as a diet shake for adults. Uh, I used to be 280 pounds. I lost 100 pounds on the breast milk as the best milk diet. I live in Silver Lake where skinny jeans are a requirement. Boom, breast milk has got me down into my skinny jeans. Uh, let's see, my, it's not my first son now. Uh, this is not my first kid. It's actually my second kid. Very, very excited about this one. Just because my first son came with so many surprises, you know? My first son, he was a miracle baby. He was born seven years old. Uh, he weighed about 55 pounds. Uh, or at least that's when he was born into my life. That's when I met him. He's a seven-year-old kid living in New Jersey with his mother. His mother's black. She lives in New Jersey. I, my, my girl out here is white, so my kid now is mixed. But the black kid lives in New Jersey. Uh, and it's hard to get to know him. The only way we get to know each other is over the phone, which is hard to do, because uh, my son only spoke in one-word answers. It'd be like, yes, no, maybe. So what I would do is I'd string together questions, so he'd have to string together answers, and it kind of sounded like we're having a real conversation. You know, I'd be like, what time did your mom get home from school? What's your mother making for dinner? And what's your favorite thing to do? Three, lasagna, play. It's a good talk, son. It's a great talk. <laughs> Or what else I would do is I'd manipulate it a little bit so he'd have to say things that I wanted to hear, you know. Uh, I'd be like, uh, last week you got sent home from school because you had a real bad case of pink what? Hate is the opposite of. And Bono was the lead singer of what group? I love 
And who the hell is Bono? I'm a seven-year-old black kid from New Jersey, and I don't know what you're talking about, sir. Should have used a two chains or a Rick Ross reference, maybe. <laughs> All right, my name is Stretch. Thank you guys very much. Come on over. Come have a seat. Hang with us on the Flapcast couch. Thank you very what? much. Hey, Stretch, that was great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. How long have you been doing comedy? Uh, it'll be four years, December first. Ah, see, the, so we get them young. See, see, yeah. four years. Four Just years. Just like flappers. Four years. Yes, I'm the same age as Clappers. Crazy. That's right. So come on, this make it for your birthday show. Yeah. <laughs> Candles, it's the good. whole thing. It's going to be fun. So do you want to start? or? Yeah, first of all, uh, obviously I love the sound of your rich voice. It's kind of like mine. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, off the top of my head, man, just in a room full of, what, four people? Sick stage presence. Just you walked up and grabbed the mic like this place was packed and it was going to be a good show. That's exactly what I was talking about earlier. You performed to, you didn't perform to the fact of four people. You just, yeah. you eased in like this was full. That was awesome. And uh, loved the switch joke. I'm a huge fan of misdirection. So I loved when you would pull us one way and then switch the other. I love that as well. And uh, bring it back the whole, the, the drug visual of the baby and the breast milk. I uh, love that. So love the joke structure, man. I love the way you do that stuff. And you have a real hypnotic rhythm that makes people drop, listen to the cadence. So that's a great weapon to use against them when they get lulled into that. Do something different like with the switch joke. That's just great. So I, I really, I dug that part. Thank you. And where can I get some cocaine? <laughs> 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 I'm first in line yeah, now. Is, uh, I wouldn't know these I days. Did, I wouldn't know these yeah. days. I could get you some breast milk if that's you want right, to. That's right, I'll do that. Yeah, that's, yeah, I, I heard this double kill I love that whole, the whole uh, comparison as well. I actually thought there might be more there. Um, just with the line, you know, using cocaine references and comparing yeah. it to the breast milk. Maybe going a little bit farther, like lines and, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was, I mean, you did a great job with it. I also, just one little picky, picky thing, but... I think you're stepping over your laughs a little bit. And okay. what I mean is like when you were in the restaurant and you were doing the, the third one, which was the take your order, which was your big yeah. punch, you um, you sort of explained over it by saying I'm in the restaurant, yeah. da, da, da. whereas I think if you would just let that hit, you would have got a really big laugh. Okay. So that's my, own, my big note there is um, just in your conversational style, which is great. Just be careful to know where those big hits are. That was one of them, you okay. know? And I was like, ah! And then you kind of trained me not to laugh because okay. you talked S a little something. bit over it. You, you know what I'm talking about. That, that line in particular, I think, is okay. a really big one about, and I'm asking to take their order, yeah. you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay. um, and then um, the, the 100 pounds, the diet shake, is really... No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but so what's interesting is all the other stuff I believed. Yeah. I mean, are you, were you really a cocaine dealer? I was. Okay, yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 I got that. And be, it, 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 I kind of like the cadence of how were you, you were good? saying we it. We want to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was. I was. I, 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 flawless career. Never got caught. Never See, got in trouble for it. Walked away on my own power. Awesome. See, that's the stuff. And I, that, that, the way you, because you describe, you have the tone yeah. and you have the brain to describe. You're breaking down a world of crime with a corporate attack angle, which yeah. I think is hysterical. And when you pull us back and forth, because you're, you know, most people get on stage talking about their drug dealing past, they're gonna do it with a different, you're, you're breaking it down logically, like, like what I'm talking about. So yeah. that's hysterical, because if you broke down the, the, the successful business model, yeah. like, like you're talking about opening up a, a cupcake factory or something, that's hysterical to me. Versus, it like, makes sometimes it, it makes people, it friendly. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I mean, I, I, I wasn't afraid of you versus, you know, some people you can be scared by right. by what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. But that's where my when you went into the um, I maybe think you just need a different setup for that. If you're going to do a fantasy tense. OK, because the way you were talking. Yeah, about that it, one usually that I'm sorry. No, good. that one usually is a. have always been thinking about cutting that part Interesting. just because I mean, like. I think it's funny, and I think it would be funny, but it's maybe I because it didn't really happen, or it's not can, right. But you can make it work if you just set it up a little different. Okay. Like all you have to do is say something like, you know, you know, my business, you know, in my business, uh, I don't know. Maybe we should. I'm gonna leave the cocaine and, and uh, 
if I start um, marketing this breast milk, yeah. maybe I should market it they as... They thought cocaine. I thought cocaine was a, a made you skinny or yes, whatever. Yes, yes. Just breast like, milk does it better. You can, have, you can achieve a cocaine you. body yeah. <laughs> yes. with a natural remedy. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I, if you're going to go fantasy, my theory is it either has to be so outrageous yeah. that we all know you're full of shit, yeah. but it's hysterical anyway. If it's not extreme enough, and we know you're kidding, and you've been honest before, it'll fall in the middle ground. Yeah. So either go hard. And you so, felt it too. Yeah, because yeah. I don't know yeah. pussies like that. They're like, you know, I'm lying. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just funny. Yeah. And then we move on. Yeah. Yeah, but see, I think you could, if you put your point of view on it, that could really make a big difference there. Um, and then the same thing happened a little bit with the white kid and. Yeah, the, yeah. Well, I, I kind of. I, there's a lot more, there's other jokes that that one kind of leads to, that's kind of like the end of it, but I just wanted to hear what you guys might have had to say about it, just the whole, like, uh, using the I love you to yeah. thing. I just wanted to hear what you guys I liked said. the reveal of the adoption, kind of. I thought it could yeah, maybe, like that. yeah, but, but that, um, we got that, like, we got that without you really pushing it too hard. But then it got a little convoluted in the setup. Because I was, I was saying about how his mo him and his mother live in New Jersey, the black kid living in New yeah. Jersey, and that got a little twisted up for me. Right. You know, I that was just, I, I didn't set it up right. But I, I like what you did, that structure yeah. of the setting up like a puzzle yeah. joke. Oh, but yeah. it, it, if you're going to do that, I think it has to, it's a complicated way to do it, and I love stuff like that. It takes a lot of time to get that to a place where it's really going to kill. Yeah. Because it's a real interesting way when you set up the puzzle, it perked my interest. Like, how's he going to explain this thing out? But those are really hard to write, too. So if you come up with a specific reason, like, if those two conversations, when put together, reveal something funny about you, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it's like, the, if they're they have to go somewhere then it's even funnier for us because then you just basically took a really creative way to tell us something else and so that but i, I like the structure that's just hard to do degree of difficulty 4.7 <laughs> <laughs> sell the breast milk back to the ex-wife the seven-year-old kid no, i don't know there's all kinds of things going through my head what i loved also is that you were personal and that's why like the weight loss thing hit me so hard because i was like oh no this guy's really got some good yeah. life stuff going on that I really I really liked. I liked that I like you as a drug deal. I mean, I, I think that that's an interesting thing. I did. I thought 13 thing. years of drug deal, just short of retirement. You yeah. 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 You collect a pension. Was, I mean, right that, right that, that made it work for me. So. <laughs> said, I used to smoke cocaine. Yeah. I, was, I was waiting for something to fall out of <laughs> well, uh, yeah. no, yeah. I mean, I still do kind of I, I don't sell this. I do this too. This is for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's a visual aid. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, drug dealer to father you know this this sort of transition that's kind of cool you know yeah. because you you are a real person and that's real life and that's that's cool that's yeah. all i have joshua what do you yeah, I, I, yeah. Mean, I like one of the reasons why i wanted to bring you on was that i think it's such a compelling story of just your life of uh -huh. you know the transition from the cocaine dealer to the uh uh the to being a father and how and you, how you've been a change and i know that that you know i don't know if you've thought Someone like Judy Carter, who talks a lot about uh, like her message of you and how yeah. you, could, you know how people can build speaking careers um, out of you know basically you know taking their lives, which were terrible, and then how they got out of it. Yeah. And that story arc of how how you got out of that life of crime into this life of another kind of crime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But how, Stealing the how hearts of black audiences market everywhere. breast milk? Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> how, 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 telling the story of how you were able to do that. Um, it, not only is it funny, but it's also if there, there there's a message to it. Yeah. It, it, I think it could open you up to a lot of other markets. Like you know maybe there might be maybe in the college market you know that beating drugs. You know, that yeah. kind of thing. Like it really. Um, Corporate people love drug references. <laughs> Pharmaceutical companies. Right? <laughs> You're big in the boardrooms, this guy. <laughs> he's he's going to go, You're doing it all wrong. With three hours' work, you're 240% profit. Your profit margins are horrible. Your bottom line is way too. But I kid you, but you've been doing that stuff on stage. You're telling us you quit to do comedy, but if you broke down the profitability hours put into cocaine, you're going to go, Basically, I'm a horrible businessman. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That is brilliant. I would love you to hear from folks. You people do it all wrong. <laughs> You carry well, a little I, luggage. I had a coat. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I uh, 
I want to get more into it, but you know, more along the lines of not drug dealing itself, but just like some of the stuff I can use. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, just offhand, like bartending. I did bartending because it was kind of like the closest thing to selling drugs. It's, you know what I mean? It's, it's basically it's, right there because that's you taking incremental steps, moving away. Right, yeah. I couldn't live completely, so slinging booze. That's my way. Yeah. 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 Using my skill set. Yeah, I'm not slinging rocks. No exactly. Like drinks on the rocks. Exactly. Right there, yeah. That's a great thing. That incremental moves. Yeah. Yeah. You don't just leave drug dealers. Yeah. You, you don't just you walk away. Yeah, exactly. You, know, you, you die. You don't just you die. You don't walk away. Yeah. I mean, I want to use yeah, there's it, but so much there. I, I, I've heard that people don't want to hear about it. Like oh, they don't oh, want oh, to. Oh, stop listening to that right now. I, I Let's would uh, can this your, right here. but the way you deliver that, yeah. You before you opened your mouth and even told me who you were, I wanted to listen to you by the way you stepped up yep. to the microphone Agreed. that you had something to say. Yeah. So I mean, I disagree. You know, if people step up. And they don't sell me on their presence, and the first words out of their mouth is trying to shock me. I, I'm, I'm already out. But you stepped up like you were a comedian that had something entertaining to say. So the message was just a pleasant surprise. And we listened to you. And just I'm gonna if you you can listen to a previous podcast and me saying this to comics every day. But uh, don't don't listen to those naysayers. Just yeah. you have use what you know. Talk about what you know, be who you are, be an authentic person, and I guarantee you, we have the perfect example of it right here with Mr. James P. Connolly. Because I sold drugs for 12 years. <laughs> I guess the 13-year mark is what makes it comedically successful. Because I found a dozen wasn't quite, so. Good for you. Right. Yeah. Good for you. But that, uh, that, you got me by one year. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize that you stated it. One more year, I can do that. <laughs> But, um, you know, just say what you have to say and don't let anyone stand in your way of that. And that is what will come out. And you have natural talent, joke structure. Your, your um, uh, performance ability is, is a no-brainer. Uh -huh. um, if anything, like I said, I just tighten up some of your setups a little bit. You know, and like I said, I think we gave you some great ideas today on yeah, ways sure. you can spin it. But I'll charge you for a lot of those later. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Talk to me after the podcast. The invoice will be so I pay in Bresno, <laughs> just so you know. I pay in Bresno. Oh, <laughs> so there's a market for that. <laughs> well, you don't want that anymore, do you? I can sell that where I live. <laughs> Does it taste good? Oh, it's a little guys, sweet. Really? It's a, I, didn't, I didn't taste it for the longest you did. time. Both you men with babies, you tasted it. Well, I mean, sometimes oh, some oh, spills oh. on you yeah. or in your glass, oh. and then you have to. <laughs> Somehow it gets in your coffee. Or whatever. It gets in your smoothie. And then you're just like, you know, throw some whey protein. I've never tasted it, I can honestly say. Josh? No, no, no. no. All right. I'll leave it to you guys. So, is it marketable or not? Well, you know what? Russian bodybuilders drink it because it has complete protein. Well, then, so it has to be good. <laughs> Chinese factory workers make it, so it has to be safe. Stretch the Russian, Just Russian athletes. Yeah. The hallmark of standards in your health. So Thank you so much for joining much for us today. I hope I you had a good time it. and that was helpful. Thank you. you All right. Keep, keep your eye out for stretch. Did I say it right? Yes. Was it stretch? Like you should stretch the name? No? All right. That's when I should shut up uh, and let the sexy voice wrap us out with um, you're here this weekend. I'm here this weekend for Flapper's birthday weekend. I understand the tickets are free. Oh. The talent is great. And there's cake and champagne. And if you come to the wrong flappers, you can't because they're both doing birthday celebrations. That's so, right. Yeah, what a great deal. And who is out in Claremont this weekend? Out in Claremont, we have Devin and Joel performing oh. Friday and Saturday. Improv couple. Yes. They then, play with you in the audience. They and then uh, on Sunday in Claremont, and this is not free, but this is Dana Carvey will be performing. Oh, that's right. Well. Dana Carvey. We, we have to pay Dana Carvey because he <laughs> he has a long career. and Not that you don't. No, no, but no, still, no. what better way we'll to celebrate pay four years? If, than if Myself or Dana Carvey, one of us was more likely to work for breast milk, I would be working. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you again for listening to another exciting episode of the Flapcast. Don't forget to check out our website uh, at flapperscomedy.com for the latest schedule. And come and celebrate our birthday this weekend. Thanks Would you like some breast milk? I mean, um, drinks or food to take uh, home? You know what I'll do with, uh... You want to take food to go home?
for your lovely. Maybe I should. Yeah. I make my wife. Well, we, we, we pay you for this black glass of food. I'll, I'll take some over. And, uh, yes. That'd be awesome. Um, that way, if I'm late, she'll go, well, guess what? Do you want 